Hey guys, today I'll show you a supernatural horror TV series named Hellbound Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins on a sunny afternoon with a crowd watching a video on the internet. The man speaking in the video is named Jinsu, who is a church leader. He informs the viewers that a select group of humans will receive an invitation from hell. Those who receive this invitation will be sent to hell at the appointed time. As Jinsu speaks, the video shows three creatures resembling giant gorillas charging into a crowd, causing chaos and destruction. Yet no one notices a man sitting nervously to the side, fixated on the time displayed on his phone. When the clock strikes 1.20, a horrifying event unfolds. A creature appears beside the man who is powerless to resist. In a desperate bid for survival, he flees for his shitty life. But the swift creature pursues him, destroying countless vehicles in its path. It overtakes the man, and after subjecting him to a brutal beating, the three creatures aim their palms at him, and a strong white light appears. The man is incinerated, leaving only remnants behind as the creatures vanish under the gaze of the onlookers. The scene shifts to a police conference surrounding the incident. Given its horrific nature, the police resolve to uncover the truth at all costs and quell the public's panic. Senior Officer Hoon is ordered to investigate Jinsu, who was holding a religious gathering nearby when the creatures appeared. This religion, known as the New Truth Church, has a resonant name, and Jinsu's online statements seem closely related to the creature's actions. Upon receiving the order, Hoon and his partner set out. On the way, the partner starts collecting information about the New Truth Church online. Rumors suggest that the church is relatively new and closely linked to another organization known as the Arrowhead. Hoon is troubled by this since Arrowhead is audacious, always evading the police and leaking personal information of criminals. Upon arriving at the crime scene, investigators inform Hoon that no useful clues have been found. Hoon then turns his attention to the church, where Jinsu is delivering a sermon. He tells the audience that the creatures are prophet angels from hell, sent to kill sinners guilty of heinous crimes, including sexual assault, arson, and murder. These hellish angels serve as a divine warning, intended to make the human world more peaceful. Hoon waits until Jinsu finishes his speech. They start talking, but soon Hoon spots a familiar figure nearby, a little girl named Heejin, his own daughter. To his dismay, Heejin is volunteering at the New Truth Church. Hoon is furious and confronts her, questioning why she isn't attending school. Heejin, not wanting to argue, quickly leaves. Jinsu witnesses the exchange, speaks to Hoon in a kind tone, promising to ensure Heejin spends less time at the church. Hoon is left seething with frustration, his daughter being managed by a stranger who is also a suspect in his eyes. Jinsu then tells Hoon he has other matters to attend to, but invites him to continue their conversation as they walk. Jinsu then started introducing himself. He told Hoon that he grew up in the church as an orphan and always found life rather meaningless. After coming into some money, he thought about splurging it all before taking his own life. However, he accidentally encountered the hellish angels attacking humans. In that moment, something sparked in his eyes. It was as if he had an epiphany. He began searching everywhere for traces of these hellish angels and even established the New Truth Church. Hearing this, Hoon asked Jinsu what exactly was the relationship between the New Truth Church and the Arrowhead organization. Jinsu explained that the Arrowhead consisted of fanatical members of the New Truth Church who interpreted the teachings too far and were too radical, not the kind of people he aligned with. A hint of scorn appeared on Hoon's face. In his mind, humans have enough self-discipline and don't need divine intervention and control. But Jinsu looked at Hoon seriously, saying that Hoon's wife was killed by a criminal, and that criminal must have been released from prison by now, possibly living a better life than him. He asked him if that is what he called human self-discipline. Since Hoon's expression turned sour, Jinsu left his phone number with Hoon and walked away. The scene shifts to Hoon returning home, trying to reason with his daughter. He fears that Heejin might be brainwashed by such religious organizations. She explained that she was simply volunteering, but Hoon didn't believe her words. Later, Hoon continued to search for information about the New Truth Church online. He stumbled upon comments made by a lawyer named Min, who believed that the church's growth was inseparably linked to the Arrowhead. She also offered free legal aid to victims involved in cases related to the church. Hoon remembered what Jinsu had said and typed the name of the criminal who murdered his wife into the search bar. Back when his wife was killed, a furious Hoon wanted to make the criminal pay with his life, but his police colleagues held him back. Now, six years after being released, the criminal appeared to be living a carefree life. On the other side, a woman who seemed virtuous and kind returned home. Her name was Park. 
As soon as she entered the door, her daughter and son popped out to offer birthday blessings. Park was initially happy, but in the next second, a ghastly face appeared in midair. Her son was terrified with his cell phone raised. The ghastly face pronounced Park's name, specifying her time of death as 3 p.m. five days later. At this very moment, the atmosphere in an online live broadcast room was buzzing. The host, wearing a ghost mask with the arrowhead symbol in the background, predicted that the hellish angels would take further action. He vowed to investigate the previous sins of a man recently judged by the hellish angels. Moreover, the host captured a researcher who wrote online novels, who often contradicted the Arrowhead's organization, advocating for people to believe in science and atheism. The host's actions were also to maintain the organization's dignity. In the video, the researcher was stripped of his clothes and beaten bloody. He knelt, begging for mercy, but the fanatical youth showed no pity. Before long, the young men who beat the researcher were arrested by the police. However, the youths wore mocking expressions, unafraid of the so-called police force because they were all minors. But Hoon was in good spirits because the researcher's accompanying lawyer was Min, the very lawyer he had seen online. Hoon had a brief chat with Min and took a liking to her because she also despised those churches and organizations. He left his phone number with Min, suggesting they keep in touch. Then Hoon took his frustration to the rooftop, complaining about his increasingly rebellious daughter, unable to figure out why. Back at the law firm, Min returned to find the hallway walls covered with vulgar phrases, accusing her of disrespecting the deities and that she would eventually face divine judgment. Min was undeterred. When she arrived at the office, her colleague informed her that a woman named Park had been waiting for her for a long time. Ever since the ghostly face appeared, Park had been living in fear. She went to seek a solution from the New Truth Church leader Jin Su, but he advised her to accept divine judgment and even persuaded Park to collaborate with him. He wanted to livestream the scene of Park being sent to hell by the hellish angels. After her death, Jinsu would give a large sum of money to Park's two children, considering it a worthy death. Unwilling to give in, Park sought out Min, her eyes filled with turmoil, asking if she should do as Jinsu suggested. If death was inevitable, it might be better to leave enough money for her children. According to the New Truth Church's statements, those named by the hellish angels are all people of great sin. But what sins could a powerless, divorced Park have committed? The scene shifts to the police department reeling from a recent violent death of the man at the hand hands of the hellish angels. The autopsy report indicates that the man's remains were incinerated by a mysterious force beyond the current understanding of science. The police are enraged, facing a situation that leaves them utterly helpless. At this moment, Officer Hoon receives a call from lawyer Min, who reveals that Park has been named by the hellish angels and that Jinsu wants to livestream her death. Soon after, Hoon and the group get together and discuss the matter. Min advises Park to take the money first, suggesting leaving a way out for her children. She insists on protecting Park's children from fanatics who may label them as sinners. Jinsu happily accepts Min's proposal and immediately offers a down payment. Until now, Jinsu seemed agreeable, but his demeanor changes as he begins to press Park about her personal life. When Park candidly reveals her children were fathered by two different men, Jinsu accuses her of being promiscuous, implying that's why she was abandoned. Min disapproves of his prying, but Jinsu asserts he's investigating why Park was chosen by the Prophet Angels. Later, Hoon's partner posts information in Arrowhead's live broadcast about Park's impending judgment and her children's details. It turns out the partner is also a fanatical supporter of the Arrowhead and feels obligated to let the world witness Park's judgment. Meanwhile, Heejin calls her officer father, informing him that she won't be home tonight as she plans to study overnight with classmates. However, she's already at Jinsu's place. As a man and a woman alone together, one might suspect a fishy relationship between Heejin and Jinsu. During their conversation, Heejin reveals a buried secret. She was supposed to deliver laundry to her father but forgot, resulting in her mother going instead and being killed. Heejin has been tormented by guilt, believing her carelessness led to her mother's death. Jinsu holds her tenderly, comforting her using both his words and muscles, and suggesting that since the law can't uphold justice, he will take her to create a world where no one commits crimes. Due to the exposure of Park and her children's information, Min is extremely worried. She has booked two tickets to Canada and plans to pick up the children from Park's house, sending them abroad for their safety. Hoon is also taking the situation seriously. He calls his colleagues at the police station, asking them to keep a close watch near Park's home. At this time, Jinsu appears near a man with Heejin. He tells Heejin that this man is the murderer who killed her mother and that she should send him to hell. Encouraged by Jinsu's persistent urging, Heejin rushes 
rushes out and presses the stun baton she's holding against the man. The man collapses to the ground, electrocuted, while Jinsu stands by, quietly relishing the scene. Meanwhile, Min has safely brought the children to the airport and asked the crew to escort them onto the plane. However, while riding the elevator, a man casts a suspicious glance at the children. It seems that this man could very well be a fanatical follower of the Arrowhead. Outside the airport, Park starts to laugh and then breaks down crying. Min comforts her, telling her not to worry about her children. Park doesn't respond. All she can do is wait for her death in silence. The scene shifts to a deserted warehouse where Jinsu brings Heejin. The murderer of Heejin's mother is stripped of his clothes, and with a calm expression, Jinsu knocks the murderer unconscious in front of Heejin. Then, under his direction, Heejin pushes the murderer's body into an incinerator. Flames rise, the murderer awakens, and after a brief struggle and chicken screams, he disappears into thin air. Heejin watches the murderer die in agony, revealing a smile that has been absent for a long time. Several hours later, the police arrive near the abandoned warehouse. On the ground lies the charred remains of a body that appears to have been judged by the hellish angels. The news reports the incident, stating that the deceased was a suspect in multiple murder cases and had been released by the police after his arrest. Watching the news, Hoon falls into deep thought. As a police officer, he respects the law. As a husband and a father, he constantly wishes to send the murderer to hell in the cruelest way possible. At this moment, Hoon, who has always opposed the New Truth Church, begins to question himself. If God can indeed punish the wicked, then perhaps it's not so objectionable after all. At this moment, in a live broadcast room online, an Arrowhead streamer is narrating the events. He criticizes the South Korean police for their inaction, allowing a murderer to roam free and denying the victim peace in death. Guided by God, sin will ultimately be purified. For a time, the hellish angels are highly esteemed. The streamer seizes the opportunity to demand that Park herself come forward and confess her crimes. Meanwhile, Park is paralyzed with indecision at home, where various people are preparing for a live broadcast. She has been ordered not to leave her house until she is judged, or she won't receive the three billion promised by Jinsu. Outside her window, hordes of fervent Arrowhead followers are holding signs, wishing for Park's expedited death. In their eyes, Park is a sinner verified by God and deserves more than death. On the other hand, Officer Hoon is investigating the case. Although the killer of his wife is dead, he feels that things are not so simple. He calls for the surveillance footage from the scene. Just then, a window shatters and he is knocked to the ground. In the next moment, a swarm of young people rushes into the police station, causing chaos, demanding the release of Arrowhead and church members. The scene changes. The wall of Park's house has been smashed, and outside, rows of tables and chairs have been set up, surrounded by onlookers. Everyone present has one purpose, to witness Park's death. Then the crowd parts for the ghost soldiers to walk through. These masked individuals, either wealthy or noble, are supporters of the New Truth Church, likely the source of Park's three billion compensation for the live streaming. Min sighs at the sight of them. Someone hands her an envelope, and just as she's about to open it, Park walks out of her house. Hoon has deployed a special forces team nearby and tells his men that today they must do everything to ensure Park's safety. Perhaps this is humanity's first confrontation with the hellish angels. As the countdown begins, everyone distances themselves from Park. As Park's live broadcast is underway, the commentator soberly warns the public to watch with a penitent heart as God intervenes in the affairs of humanity. As the countdown commences, Park, who had previously accepted her fate, now begins to fear. Suddenly, a loud noise is heard, and three hellish angels appear out of nowhere. Park is nailed to the wall, and the special forces are so terrified they forget to shoot. Hoon is shocked to watch his partner, who starts smiling with glee. Hoon rushes into the house and fires at the monsters, only to be thrown back by a punch. Park, bloodied, lies on the ground, begging for someone to save her. But all that awaits her is a beating from the hellish angels. The people on site and online cover their faces, horrified by the brutal scene. Then, a blinding white light appears, and Park's body turns to onion pieces. The angels leap into the air and vanish. Min kneels in the direction where Park was, and the distinguished guests outside kneel in unison. Only Min and her companions stand there, filled with despair, realizing that human power is no match for the divine. 
The next day, Hoon returns to the police station, which is strangely deserted. The television is broadcasting news that Jin Soo of the New Truth Church has become the most important person in South Korea. His deeds, including rescuing a mother and child from a fire and calming a violent thug on the street, are being exposed by reporters, suggesting that Jin Soo is the savior of this era. The reporters then connect with Jin Soo via video to hear his advice. Jin Soo states confidently that people should return to their normal lives and maintain respect for God. He mentions lawyer Min, who does not respect God and advises not to trouble her, as well as a police officer who fired at the hellish angels, implying they should be left alone. These words cause Min and Hoon to become anxious, because Jin Soo's mere statement could easily make them national enemies. However, Hoon isn't worried about this. He's more concerned about a familiar piece of clothing he sees behind Jin Soo on the TV, the same clothing he saw in surveillance footage. The clothing belonged to the killer of his wife, and Jin Soo must be involved in the killer's death. Meanwhile, in Arrowhead's live broadcast room, the host criticizes Min for her lack of respect towards God, while others are kneeling and praying. The footage of Hoon shooting at the hellish angels is also released. Seeing this, Min senses trouble. She quickly books a flight for her mother, intending to send her abroad. As she packs, she notices an unopened envelope on the table containing information about the future church. Inside, interviews with Jin Su and the pastor spark a recollection. Hoon raced to Jin Su's place in his car. The area beneath Jin Su's apartment was crammed with worshippers. Armed with an axe, he charged inside, but the apartment was empty and the familiar piece of clothing had disappeared. Now, he had not only failed to catch Jinsu, but had also landed himself in hot water because the worshippers had recognized him as the cop who shot at the hellish angels. They started assaulting and berating him. At the critical moment, Jinsu video called Hoon, which stopped the worshippers from attacking him further. Hoon got back into his car and drove to the address Jinsu had given him. Meanwhile, Min arrived at the law firm's building with her mother. She called her boss to report critical news before heading inside. However, the chaotic scene that greeted her inside the law firm left her stunned. It's the handiwork of fanatical theocrats. Her boss, beaten beyond recognition, implored Min to escape. Suddenly remembering her mother in the car, Min tried calling her but got no response. In the parking lot, members of the Arrowhead were assaulting Min's mother in a car. Min rushed down to save her but was pinned to the ground and beaten along with her. The violence continued and Min's mother suffered a severe blow to the head. Seeing the sinner's mother in such a state, the Arrowhead members left, satisfied with their deed. Stumbling and struggling, Min managed to get her mother to the hospital. As she waited there, people at the hospital cast curious glances at her. The video of Min being beaten had already gone viral. Min numbly walked to her mother's side, only to find she had stopped breathing. With this despair, Min left, driving to a house under a bridge. The man who came out was none other than the pastor, who had interviewed Jin Soo 20 years ago to the day. Min wanted to listen to that interview recording. After hearing it, she discovered that Jin Soo had mentioned receiving God's death invitation for a date 20 years in the future, which was today. Min wanted to copy the recording, but the pastor promptly deleted it, explaining that Jin Soo had already approached him to keep this a secret, promising him the chairmanship of the New Truth Church if he complied. Moreover, the pastor was supposed to help Jin Soo get rid of Min. As soon as he finished speaking, Min turned to flee, but she was surrounded by members of the Arrowhead. The pastor drove away, and Min was left to face the mob, with her fate unknown. Hoon arrived at the address given by Jin Soo, who had been waiting for him there for a long time. Jinsu confessed that he had seen a prophecy from God 20 years ago, which foretold his death 20 years later. This prophecy was the reason for Jinsu's frantic search for the traces of the demonic angels. He had hoped it was all an illusion, but reality convinced him that death was certain and only 10 minutes away. According to Jinsu, if all those judged by the demonic angels were sinners, what sins was he bearing? In truth, Jinsu was a good person, always cautious not to harm the ant and tender towards moths fluttering near lamps. He had never committed a crime, and had always strived to do good from a young age, daring to assist the elderly ladies that others ignored, and to save those who others wouldn't. Even after being condemned to hell by God, he was scared, but he gradually accepted his fate and came up with a daring idea. If this fear were to spread to everyone in the world, then sin would largely disappear as everyone would dread God's accusation. 
Jinsu gave Hoon a choice, either to record his annihilation by the hellish angels and release it to the public, shaking the authority of God as even Jinsu himself would be seen judged, or hide the truth of his death to maintain God's authority and return home to live a happy life with his daughter who had killed her mother's murderer, enjoying the peaceful new world he had helped create. As he finished speaking, the demonic angels suddenly appeared to flex their muscles, and Jinsu was beaten and crushed on the ground. The violence was extreme, and even as a believer in the angels, one could not avoid this brutal death. Hoon watched, frozen, until Jinsu was reduced to ashes under a bright light, never taking out his phone to record the event. Back at home, Hoon held his daughter. As the one who had always sought to break the power of the theocratic church, he chose to abandon his long-held beliefs for the sake of Heejin to avoid her being branded a murderer. Elsewhere beneath the bridge lay a battered body in silence. With Jinsu's death, the truth about those sent to hell began to surface. Not all sent there were sinners. But little did they know, some people will fight their best to prevent this truth from being revealed to the public. Following the live broadcast of Park's death, the number of those who believe in the demonic angels has surged. The New Truth Church created by Jinsu has become a sacred place in people's hearts. Even the president steps lightly around the church. In this climate, the New Truth Church has rapidly expanded, with no religious organization in the world able to compete. The church has established many museums displaying items related to those condemned to hell. Surprisingly, due to the pervasive fear, crime rates have plummeted to unprecedented lows. Everyone understands that once chosen by God, there is no alternative but death. Those selected no longer complain and even embrace their demise. Despite this, the demonic angels still appear at the mourners' halls, yanking out the souls of the deceased to brutally beat them. However, Jinsu's final words before death were also proven true. He had told Officer Hoon that he was not aligned with the Arrowhead, and indeed the Arrowhead members now account for more than half of the crime rate. They are more tyrannical than bullies, leaving havoc in their wake under the guise of God's name. They torment anyone who disrespects the so-called God, regardless of age or gender. The screen changes to the Grand Priest of the New Truth Church appearing on the television network. He wants to produce a grand documentary praising the doctrines of the New Truth Church. He specifically requests the official TV station to undertake this project. Jay, who is in charge of this at the TV station, is getting increasingly agitated. He has already revised it numerous times, but the Grand Priest is never satisfied, always nitpicking. Deep down, Jay believes that the New Truth Church is nothing but a troublemaker, stirring up the previously stable social order into chaos. But he dares not speak out, nor can he refuse to work, even though his wife just gave birth to their child. He has to stay and work overtime at the TV station. Jay's wife is very understanding. Not only does she not rush him, but she also offers to take some photos and videos of their child for him. She knows Jay must be eager to see how the child looks. At this moment, Jay is searching for his co-worker, hoping to copy some materials from him. On the co-worker's desk, Jay sees a business card for a high-interest loan company called Soto with an address on the back. It's a fish pond. Jay is puzzled, wondering why his co-worker keeps their card since such companies are known for their malpractices. Meanwhile, in the hospital, Jay's wife is recording a video of the child with her phone. But in the next second, she freezes in place because a grimace appears next to the child. It's a divine decree, indicating the infant will be sent to hell in three days. But how could a newborn commit sins? To find an answer, the wife begins to search online, only to find that such an outrageous event has never happened anywhere in the world. She starts to wonder if her child committed many sins in a past life. Even so, she can't accept that the child she carried for ten months will die tragically in three days, and she has no way to stop this cruel fate from unfolding. On the other side, Jay is rushing to the hospital, somewhat worried because his wife isn't answering his calls. He thought she was upset over his overtime. Then another call comes in. It's the co-worker's wife who has called because she can't find her husband and is asking about him. She tells Jay that there have been constant debt collectors at their home and that her husband has been acting strangely. Hearing this, Jay reassures her that everything will be all right. After hanging up, Jay recalls the business card on his co-worker's desk and realizes that he might have been unable to repay a high-interest loan and is now being harassed by debt collectors. The more Jay thinks about it, the more concerned he becomes. He decides to go look for his co-worker first to prevent him from doing anything foolish. So Jay heads to the fish pond address on the business card. When Jay was nearing the fish pond, he encountered members of the Arrowhead faction. These people were known for their treachery and malevolent acts, including rape and plunder. 
They delighted in falsely accusing others of divine judgment. They stopped Jay to interrogate him, asking if he had been condemned by God and was seeking a good place to take his own life. Jay honestly explained that he was a TV station employee working on a documentary for the New Truth Church and that he was out late looking for materials. After hearing his explanation, the Arrowhead members let him go, as they didn't want to meddle in church affairs. Upon arriving at the fish pond, Jay spotted his co-worker's car and saw him sitting beside it. When he saw Jay, he panicked and jumped into the fish pond. Jay hurried to rescue him, and only then did he learn the truth. It turned out that the co-worker had received divine judgment and was due to be sent to hell shortly. He wanted to die quietly to avoid bringing trouble to his family, as no family of a sinner ever ended well. He begged Jay to turn a blind eye and keep this matter secret. After his death, people from the Soto Company would handle the scene and fabricate the cause of death. As soon as he finished speaking, a hellish angel burst forth, and the man had no chance to resist. He gradually disappeared before Jay's eyes, and as the pond began to glow brightly, once the light had dissipated, the man's body was nothing but charred remains. The ordeal terrified Jay nearly to the point of wetting himself. Soon after, the Soto Company's people arrived, took the man's remains, and warned Jay to keep his mouth shut, or else he'd have no grave to lie in. In the distance, a woman watched the scene unfold. It turned out to be lawyer Min, who had been betrayed by the pastor. The next moment, Jay was injected with a sedative. Afterward, one of the Soto Company employees asked whether they should eliminate Jay. If their operations were exposed, a single word from the New Truth Church could lead to a global siege on them. The suggestion, however, was overruled by Min. She decided to have someone keep an eye on Jay before she left the scene. Unnoticed by everyone, the business card Jay had seen earlier had fallen into a corner. Min, who had been attacked by the Arrowhead, not only survived, but also led a group of victims to form the Soto Company to resist the New Truth Church. Afterward, Jay wakes up in his car. He rushes to the hospital to see his wife. Fearing that she would worry, he didn't mention the events of the night. However, his wife had more troubling news. She handed her phone to Jay to show him a video that left him thunderstruck. Back at the fish pond, the area was swarming with police and members of the New Truth Church. The church's influence had grown so much that they could interfere with police investigations, intent on ensuring that the families of sinners could not escape the public's retribution. After a brief investigation, the police concluded that Jay's co-worker had fled because of his debts. As everyone prepared to leave, the grand priest of the church discovered the business card on the ground. Meanwhile, a desperate wife is crying to Jay, questioning the seemingly arbitrary nature of divine judgment because she refuses to believe their child is a sinner. Jay is also clueless about the matter and advises his wife to keep it hidden. Before leaving, Jay looks at his child in the swaddle, disheartened, and exits the hospital. The divine judgment, which had always targeted sinners, was now inexplicably targeting the newborn. It seemed like the world fell into a greater disaster after the arrival of God's intervention. Since his child is identified by God as a sinner, Jay is at a loss for a solution. Suddenly, he remembers the organization named Soto. On the surface, Soto's activities seem to be the antithesis of the New Truth Church. He starts to search online for information about Soto and is somewhat surprised by what he finds. Soto means forbidden zone, and even the most heinous criminals, as long as they are within this zone, can evade divine judgment. Jay quickly realizes that this organization's mission must be to protect those who have been judged, or in other words, the families of those sinners. Because for the sinners, death is certain. Currently, the New Truth Church is interrogating a sinner named Kim. A few days ago, he was sentenced to death by God, with his execution set for this afternoon. According to the church's protocol, Kim would be taken to the church, humiliated in various ways, and then his death would be live-streamed to deter others from sinning. Kim is in despair. The church's power is so great that he doesn't even have the right to choose his own death. After the interrogation, the Grand Priest accidentally catches sight of a business card with the word Soto on it, sparking some curiosity. Afterward, Kim's death is being live-streamed. He is stripped naked and placed on a stage. Not only him, but his family is also forcibly brought in to witness his demise under the church's coercion. After a 30-second countdown, the prophet angels appear, and Kim is surrounded. The fear of death drives him to attempt escape, but the angels give him no chance. Moreover, their method of killing has taken on a new form. Kim's limbs are tied with ropes, and his flesh is torn from his body piece by piece, followed by a spree of smashing. After these brutal scenes, Kim dies in agony, and the live stream brings a significant income to the church. The pastor's smile splits his face. 
Meanwhile, Jay drives to a university. He has found out that one of the members of the Soto from that night is a professor from this university. But as soon as he arrives at the school, he is taken into a room by several burly men. The professor is there. Inside, the professor explains the truth about the prophet angels to Jay. It turns out that the demonic creatures seem to randomly choose humans to be killed, and those chosen are simply unlucky. The term sinner is a conspiracy of the New Truth Church to make the world believe what the church says is correct, thus establishing the church's authority and allowing the church to manipulate people's lives. The existence of the Soto organization is to save the family members of the victims. If the judged victims are found by them first, that's good. But if the church publicly condemns them, Soto must get to the victims before the church does. Otherwise, none of the victims' families will be spared. The members of Soto are either family members of victims or those persecuted by the Arrowhead. After hearing all this, Jay is somewhat relieved. He knows he has come to the right place. Jay takes out his phone and confesses that his newborn child has been judged. At this moment, the pastor's attention is also drawn to the Soto organization. However, he doesn't regard them with any concern, given the overwhelming power of the church. His interest lies solely in lawyer Min. The pastor orders the grand priest to join forces with the Arrowhead to take down Min and her organization, no matter the cost. Meanwhile, Jay is still puzzled. If the demonic creatures are merely attacking people randomly, not an expression of divine will, why then is the timing of a person's death judged so precisely? The professor cannot answer this question without further research. As a scientist, he suggests that if science cannot explain it now, it will have to wait until it can. Even if such events are the work of a god, humans should stand up against it, believing that if a god demands death, there is no need to revere such a deity. Subsequently, the professor brings Jay to meet Min. She informs Jay that all evidence of his child's judgment has been erased, including video surveillance. She reassures him that there's no need to worry about the New Truth Church discovering his child because the child is innocent without a sin. If the world were to find out, the church's doctrine would collapse on itself. The church would likely try to pin the child's death on Jay or someone else, accuse them of a heinous crime, or they might make the child disappear as if they never existed. The church's cruelty is far greater than this. To maintain their disordered divine order, they periodically execute some sinners in public. If no sinners are found, they frame innocent people. In a word, this divine order was created by the now-deceased Jinsu, who crafted God's lie in front of the world. Now, since some groups had made benefits based on this established order, breaking it is pretty difficult, but an opportunity has now arisen. If Jay agrees to offer up his child for a public live broadcast of an innocent child being judged, the lie of divine judgment would crumble. Hearing this, Jay turns and walks away. He thought Soto was the only remaining bastion of justice in the world, but it seems they too are willing to take advantage of the lives of the innocent, and worse, his own child. As Jay leaves, Min quickly follows him. She's been waiting for this opportunity for a long time, and tells Jay that if he doesn't agree, she can help him fake the child's death, implying that one way or another the child cannot escape death. Meanwhile, members of the Arrowhead are brutally torturing a man, a member of Soto. The man is defiant, saying nothing, but upon witnessing his wife being violated, he can only utter the professor's name. On the other side, the professor has just finished explaining the situation to Jay. Only then does Jay learn that the professor's daughter also faced judgment. It's revealed that they were out for a walk when the judgment suddenly struck. Unlike others, his daughter had only one minute from the appearance of the judgment to her death. With confusion in her eyes, she looked at her father, who watched as the hellish angel rapidly approached. After the horrific car accident, both father and daughter were bloodied. The daughter was thrown out of the car by the hellish angel, her once graceful body turned into charred remains. After sharing this, the professor departs. On his way home, Jay encountered a car crashing towards him. The professor was surrounded by members of the Arrowhead and was taken away after being drugged. Jay also returned home feeling conflicted. He discussed with his wife about the possibility of sacrificing their child to break the rule of the New Truth Church and save more people. He left the choice to his wife, but in reality she had no choice at all because their child was doomed either way. Meanwhile, the professor was bound and thrown onto the ground, in a similarly miserable state as another Soto member, who had betrayed him. The members of the Arrowhead did not interrogate the professor because his associate had already confessed everything about Soto to save his wife. The Arrowhead pushed the professor into an incinerator, and they planned to do the same with Min, as her location had been surrounded by their members. Min started to flee, but no matter where she ran, she couldn't escape them. Eventually, she confronted the Grand Priest directly. 
Thanks to her skills in combat, she managed to subdue the Grand Priest on the ground and narrowly escaped. The next day, two mutilated bodies were hung at the entrance of the university where the professor worked, himself and his associate. Jay was shocked upon hearing the news broadcast about this incident, especially since he had just had an in-depth conversation with the professor the night before. He checked his phone and saw that the arrowhead had released the professor's personal information. Sure enough, the professor's affiliation with the Soto organization was exposed, along with the organization's acts that defied the will of God. Not only that, but Min's photo was also revealed, and the arrowhead denounced her as a heretic, calling for everyone to take her down. Just then, Jay received a call from Min, who asked how he was considering their situation. Jay still did not have an answer. Min then urgently asked about the whereabouts of his wife and child. When Jay said they were at home, Min urged him to check on them as the church and arrowhead might have already taken them. At that moment, a taxi stopped at the church's entrance and outstepped Jay's wife, holding the child. Now the child has become the only hope to overthrow the church and break the theocracy. After speaking with Min on the phone, Jay tries to call his wife, but there's no answer. After a while, he receives a text from his wife saying that she has arrived at the church. At this moment, the Grand Priest is meeting with the wife, seeking a way to save her child. She hands over a video of her child's trial to the Grand Priest, demanding to know why her newborn is being treated as a sinner. The Grand Priest is momentarily at a loss and calls a meeting with the church officials. The decision is made to hide this matter at any cost, or else God will lose credibility in the public eye. Meanwhile, Jay has joined up with Min and the remaining members of the Soto organization. Whether they can turn the tides in this desperate situation remains to be seen. The scene shifts to the church, where Jay's wife is under house arrest and her child has been taken by church members. The church is surrounded by reporters because the professor was burned to a crisp by the arrowhead, an incident that has had a terrible impact since the professor was not judged by God. At the same time, Min arrives with reinforcements. To divert attention, a Soto member loudly proclaims that he has been judged by God and his time of death is imminent. This draws the reporters to swarm around the Soto member, allowing Min and Jay to break into the church. In the corridor, they encounter Jay's wife and the child. Min charges with a police baton, and a fight is about to break out. Church personnel grab the child and run. Seeing this, the wife quickly follows, and with Jay's help, they manage to take their child back. After a fierce chase, they make it to the parking lot and drive away from the church. Following these events, the Grand Priest becomes the scapegoat. The pastor berates him for his incompetence, beating his head repeatedly. The child's time of death is tomorrow, and if this matter is exposed, the foundation of the New Truth Church will be thoroughly shaken, and the pastor's supreme status will become a joke. The public has long held grievances against the church, and they too need such an excuse to rebel. At this moment, Min is still trying to persuade Jay and his wife with the same argument. Since the child is doomed to die, why not save more people with their decision? Jay and his wife are now resolute. The child's death seems inevitable, and the church's vile face has driven them to despair. They feel they have no other choice. So, Min immediately arranges for Soto members to prepare for the child's death to be live-streamed. But little does she know, the Soto member handling the situation is actually the same broadcaster from Arrowhead's live streaming room. The scene switches to Min filming a live broadcast preview, telling the public to tune in promptly at 9.30 the next evening. Meanwhile, the church is also discussing how to respond. They consider slandering the child as a born sinner, but this conflicts with the church's doctrine. Dismissing it as a fake video also lacks credibility. Until dawn, a call is made to the pastor. The caller is none other than the broadcaster from the Arrowhead, who tells the pastor that he knows the whereabouts of Min and the child, and that he has also been judged by God, with a death time only five minutes later than the child's. This gives the pastor hope. If handled correctly, they can use the broadcaster's death to cover up the truth of the child's judgment. But the broadcaster is not cooperative. After all, he's a man facing his own death. After the call, he tosses his phone on the ground and walks away. However, this clue is enough for the Grand Priest to locate and rush to the scene via the phone's GPS. By this time, Soto is fully prepared. They want to find a quiet and auspicious place to livestream the child's death. But the broadcaster makes a covert move, killing the person meant to meet Jay. 
Jay sees the badly beaten Soto member on the ground and the broadcaster who emits a sinister laugh, filling Jay's heart with fear. The broadcaster, upon noticing Jay, prepares to finish him off with a dagger. He tells Jay that even God makes mistakes, which is why he needs someone to rectify them, and he believes himself to be the perfect candidate. If he kills the child before the judgment, people will think the judged one was him, not the innocent child, and God can continue to intervene in this world with credibility, making it a better place. Hearing this, Jay feels helpless. He's never seen someone so deluded thinking that he can reason with a normal person, but there's no point in arguing with someone so irrational. His only option is to run. Jay takes off, but the broadcaster easily pins him to the ground. Then the broadcaster storms into the room where Jay's wife and the child are, intent on killing the child. Min arrives just in time and falls into muscle wrestling with the broadcaster. Jay's wife runs off with her child. Due to the loud commotion, the surrounding residents are awakened. The woman knows she has nowhere to go and decides to wait for her child's death right there. At this moment, the Grand Priest is on his way. The hellish angels have arrived as expected. They descend from the sky and charge toward the child. Witnessing this, Jay's wife rushes towards her child. As a mother, she cannot bear to see her child die. Even if it's futile, she must protect her child. Jay, who had been knocked unconscious, also wakes up and joins the battle to protect the child. However, the hellish angels are impervious to weapons and immune to fire and water. Human attacks are useless against them. Everyone is powerless to resist. Once again, Jay makes a choice. He holds his wife and child close. If the child must die, they will die together. The next moment, the hellish angels approach them and a dazzling white light appears. All that is left on the ground are charred remains. Min is in despair. The plan has utterly failed and three people have died. So there is no way to tell the public that an innocent child was the one being judged. But in the next second, the cry of a baby is heard. Underneath the charred corpses of Jay and his wife lies the still living child. Everyone is in shock, wondering why the judged one is still alive and if the will of the gods was changed. The next moment, the broadcaster prepares to kill the child. Perhaps in his eyes, it's merely a small mistake by the gods. Min rushes forward to tangle with the broadcaster, determined to protect the child who survived by the hand of gods at any cost. Maybe this child is the savior of the world. Soon the hellish angels reappear, this time targeting the broadcaster. They grasp his neck and drag him across the ground with cruel motions. Afterwards, a white light ascends, and their most devoted follower is sent to hell by their own hands. After the hellish angels leave, the scene is silent. Min holds the surviving child filled with confusion. She cannot yet explain why the child survived. In the original plan, the child should have already been dead. The church's order begins to collapse. In the distance, the grand priest rushes over, intending to keep Min and the child, but the public stops him. A man courageously questions the gods, and the grand priest, in a rage, beats him to the ground. The police cannot stand by and watch such brutality. The next moment, the police arrest the grand priest. After witnessing the judged child survive, the people begin to believe that the child is innocent and should be born without sins. Since the gods have taken away their right to a normal life, it's time to challenge their authority and overthrow them. Meanwhile, Min reaches the roadside and hails a taxi. She tells the driver to take the main road, the further the better, but the driver calmly suggests that the main road will lead to the police, and it's better to take the side roads. It turns out, the mysterious taxi driver knows Min. Inside the church's museum, a bizarre event occurs. One of the sinner's remains starts to tremble. The next moment, smoke rises and sparks fly. The charred sinner comes back to life. With the body's restoration, the long dead park appears on camera, adding more mysteries to the show. And with that, the drama abruptly ends here. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.